Thank you. So, uh, I'd like to call the meeting of the Sunderland uh, School Committee to order on, uh, let's see, we got uh, May 14th at 401. Apologize. I know to silence my cell phone, but I'm not used to having to kill my, my regular phone. All right. Uh, can we get a motion to uh, approve the minutes? So moved. Got a second? I'll second. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Any discussion? All right. Uh, all in favor? Yeah, aye. Raising hands, eyes. Uh, Keith? Aye, okay. Uh, unanimous. 5-0. Five 5-0. -oh. Five -oh. Thank you. All right. Uh, and uh, Shelley, do we want to uh, review the uh, the uh, warrants and financials? Yes. So I'm going to preface this since it happens every meeting that I have two dogs and they do bark and I will mute if it happens, but it's been happening every day. So I apologize in advance. Um, so Sunderland had seven warrants that were signed electronically in May, totaling $56,895 and 24 cents. Um, thank you for reviewing and signing those electronically. We are going to have another batch of warrants. Um, the town runs their warrants twice a month. And in order to fall in alignment with them, now that we're moving electronically, it will actually help the town accountant workload if we can spread it out twice a month instead of having everything all in one large batch. So um, you'll see another round, I think, coming out late next week that need a another round of signatures. And we're going to try to continue with that process of running twice a month um, as long as we're working electronically. Um, I did share out the expense reports. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, but basically what we've been doing since we last met was looking at the general fund to see what the available balance would be between now and year end um, to see how we can use those funds to support fiscal year 21 if needed. And we currently have about 110,000 available that, that is not yet scheduled to be spent um, between now and the end of the year. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit further when we get to the um, budget section, which I'm not sure if that's next on the agenda and you want me to keep going. Oh, public comment. Okay. Um, so I'll stop for now and then continue on when we get to the item on the agenda. Any, uh, any questions, discussion? Not saying. All right. Public comment. Is there anyone who uh, wishes to make comment? Okay. In that case, uh, Let's go to the unfinished business, further budget discussions. Okay, so what we prepared is a, uh, the document that we sent out and I'll share it on the screen in a moment. Um, basically the town has requested that we look at a 20% 20 20 reduction in chapter 70 funding. And so um, we put together a um, response to that question. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present it Shelly's going to walk us through it. There'll be plenty of times to plenty of time to ask questions and comment, and at the end we'll have some uh, some decisions to make about how we want to move forward. So we here go ahead and present my screen here. Yeah. I know you, you also have a copy of it, but for those looking at it, can you does it look all right? Yep. Looks yes. Fine. Yeah. Right. Yeah, if you can scroll down a little bit more to try to get all of that FY20 info together. There you go. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go through the whole thing and then we'll take questions at the end. That seems to be working out with a couple of meetings that we've had so far that we've gone through the same process. So um, jot them down, you know, take mental note, whatever it is, and then we'll go ahead and have a big discussion at the end. Um, but what I wanted to start with here is a continuation of what I was saying in the in the short financial report is that we've analyzed the budget, um, what we already have expended, what we have encumbered, and then what we have remaining. So we're looking at 110,000 remaining to be spent between now and June 30th in Sunderland. Uh, and then from there, I went ahead and looked at all of the accounts to see what we anticipate spending and what we anticipate being savings for this year. So of that 110,000, we're looking at about 65,000 that will be spent between now and June 30th. 
with a savings of about 45,000 for, for Sunderland. Um, that both of those numbers could fluctuate. Um, some of them are maintenance related, some of them are building utility related. So depending on how the rest of the year pans out, both of those numbers could go up and down a little bit. So everything is really just an estimate at this point. Um, but that's, you know, I feel pretty good about these numbers. So with that 45,000, uh, the administration has a couple of recommendations. Mm -hmm. The first is in regards to technology needs. Um, since we've done uh, electronic or remote learning, uh, many students have used devices from the school. Um, and we're finding that we'd like to move ahead with a one-to-one -one initiative at all of the elementary schools. Um, for Sunderland, that equates to between repairs and new devices, we're looking at about a $40,000 rich request from technology. Um, and we know that right now, that's not possible to do that full amount, but given we do have some savings this year, we would like to go ahead and allocate 20,000 of that to make the repairs that are necessary to the existing devices and start purchasing um, Chromebooks and or iPads if the iPads are used in the younger grades um, so that if we do have to do remote learning again in the fall in any capacity, we're better prepared to meet the needs of our students. Um, and then that leaves us with about 25,000 after that technology purchase that we would like to reallocate back to school choice so that we can use that money to support the FY21 budget cuts that we're anticipating. Uh, you can scroll down a little bit, Darius. To, yeah, perfect. All right, so um, just a reminder for FY21, this is the previously approved budget amount, 3,000, I mean, sorry, $3,099,659. It was a 4.9% increase over fiscal year 20. And then there is a short list of things that contributed to that increase, which include um, teacher contractual wages. So we have a placeholder in there for our teacher negotiations um, for wage increases. We have the step increases included. We have the IA contract wage, a step and COLA included, non-union personnel wage increases. Uh, we reallocated, if you remember, a speech position off of the SPED revolving funds because that, that account was not able to continue to support that position given a reduction in incoming tuition into the special ed program. And then we had a new hire, a full-time teaching position as a team leader. And then we had some other minor salary, a uh, non-salary expense increases, um, primarily maintenance related. So as Darius said, um, the state and local revenue is anticipated to be down in FY21. The reduction amount remains un unknown at this time. Um, I think last time we met, we had talked about the town had requested a 5% reduction prior to the COVID crisis or right around the time that it was happening. Um, and now they're looking at a request of a 20% loss in Chapter 70 funding. That's what they've asked that we look at to see if that's possible with our budget. So for Sunderland, that would mean a $175,000 reduction in Chapter 70 funding. <clears throat> so looking ahead to FY21 on what changes we need to make moving forward. So the administration recommends that we move ahead with a level funded budget and we use school choice funds to support reductions after considering where individual line items can be reduced. Um, so level funding is slightly less than a 20% reduction in chapter 70, it's 144,000 that we would be pulling off of the budget. Um, and I gave you the level funded amount there, it would be $2,954,946. Uh, so we took some steps to look at that number of what level funding would look like and made the some reductions to date, which are listed here. Uh, we eliminated 55,000 in salaries, um, which there are a few options for us to do that, but you know we're still debating what the best options are there, but it's a total value of 55,000. Uh, we do we reduced non-salary expenses by $13,615. That would mean anything that we increased in FY21, we dropped back down to the FY20 um, budget number that we could. There were some things that we couldn't reduce, such as trash was left out of FY20 because we had a trash vendor change. Um, I know you know this, I'm just kind of repeating because we have some public on the um, call. So some things couldn't be reduced down, but wherever I could, I did do that. So that was almost $14,000. And then that $25,000 in savings we're expecting from FY20, um, moving $25,000 worth of expenses to school choice. 
So um, we made reductions of $93,615 with a remaining amount to be reduced of $51,098. Uh, so in order to do that, to get us to level funding, we are recommending that we use school choice funds. Oh, I have a typo. 51. I love live documents. <laughs> um, so we are recommending that we use school choice funds to cover that additional amount rather than cutting any positions or programming. And the reason for that is that our special education director, Karen Ferrandino, just went ahead and did our school choice SPED increment calculations. And we are looking at bringing in about $80,000 more in school choice revenue than we anticipated due to um, special ed needs. So that 80,000, although, you know, there is always some concern that DESE could reject some of our increments that we put in. Um, we do think that there is enough of a buffer there between the 80,000 and the 51,000 that needs to be funded. And even if they did come back and say they weren't gonna full that fund, fully fund that 80,000 increase, um, we do still have enough of, a, of savings there to account for the, any reduction that they may make. So, um, 80,000 minus 51,000, pretty easy math. If it all works out well, we'd be looking at 29,000 that we would still be able to roll into next year. So we're not hitting any existing school choice <laughs> revenue, which is why we felt comfortable that this was the smoothest path to go without having to make any additional staffing or programming reductions. And the final piece uh, to share before we start discussing further is, a couple of other concerns that we have. So the early childhood program um, right now is in an okay position still. Early, uh, Sunderland lost about 18,000 in revenue with the school closure. Um, sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, so going into FY21, we're still in pretty good shape there, but long-term to FY22 is more of the concern because we're only predicted to have about 10,000 uh, left in that account at the end of next year. And that doesn't give us much wiggle room if there is any change in enrollment between now and the beginning of the year or mid-year. We're not sure how classroom sizes are going to be impacted or if any of our families are going to need to apply for sliding scale or if they're not going to be able to afford early childhood at all. So there's definitely some concern there and just wanted to have that on the radar as something we might have to discuss again as the school year approaches. Um, and then any other COVID-related back-to-school expenses, the number of 10 to 30,000 is really just kind of pulled out of thin air. You know, Darius and I tried to come up with some things and some ideas, but this is all unknown right now. If we're going to need additional um, cleaning supplies, additional additional nursing supplies, a remote learning is going to impact. So again, might be something that we have to talk about further as the school year approaches. Um, and the final comment was just to let you know where we're at in regards to that 20% reduction that the town requested. So if we did go to the 20% reduction in Chapter 70 funding, we would be needing to cut an additional $31,000 from the budget. I know that's a lot of information and I do talk pretty quickly. Um, so I'm happy to back up, go over something again. You know, let me know what comments, questions you have. If you need a minute to digest it, fully understand. Shelly? Yes. Um, first of all, I would really like to thank you for sending this out in advance to the meeting. Um, I know it was only a couple hours ago, but it gave me a chance to sit down and read it and think about it a bunch and so on. And so, um, boy, that was just great to see that. Um, my overall view of this is that, um, you know, obviously the, um, it, it's it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be because of the additional money that looks like is going to be available uh, through school choice so that we can uh, stick with our plan to not spend uh, down that account, uh, you know, and end up the year worse off. Um, you know, that's what we've been trying to avoid since the problems of the last couple of years. And by having this extra money that Karen is, uh, um, I guess we're being, what, more diligent in terms of making sure we claim every possible SPED increment we can. And um, that sure, you know, helps, uh, helps the overall situation so that my, I guess my overall view of what you proposed here is 
Um, I can't think of a better way to do it, so I would be supportive of it. Great, thank you. My my comment just to where we're at here, the town looking at chapter 70 being reduced by 20% in the um, talks of superintendents, that's not gonna happen. Um, it looks like the state legislature is not talking, they're talking about maybe even level funding chapter 70. I know it's just a, it's a you know, we're switching back from a 5% to now we'll get 20% of chapter 70. Um, it's just different ways to free up money that I know the town's gonna need because revenue is gonna affect the revenue um, down uh, the lack of revenue to the state is certainly going to affect um, the town in some way. Um, I don't believe it's going to happen in Chapter 70 the way they're they're playing it out here. I just wanted to say that out loud as somebody who's been you know you know trying to find out whether communities are looking at for indicators. Um, and there's a full kind of range of indicators, but nobody's looking at Chapter 70 being reduced by that much. I was on the, a phone call with or chat with the state legislators of Ma uh, Western Mass on Friday. Um, they're really going to be trying to be pushing to level fund chapter 70 um, because, you know, the, obviously um, there was supposed to be a big expanse in chapter 70 with Student Opportunity Act. Um, that pretty much, I'm not sure if that's going to happen. Um, but, you know, looking at trying to, you know, again, fund chapter 70 in this year's in 20s um, numbers, I think is it might be their goal. So um, my, my, I do have concerns that they will uh, go after other things. Um, it, while transportation doesn't affect this budget, it's gonna affect Frontier, they most likely will go after transportation. Um, they'll probably look at um, circuit breaker. So the amount of money we spend on special education over $45,000 um, and the, the percentage of reimbursement there. So they're gonna go after these other kind of lines that are gonna hurt us in different ways. Um, but as you know, they have to cut from somewhere. So um, just kind of a, what's happening out there in the world of um, funding of education, so. I'm going to stop sharing the screen so I can see people's faces, if you don't mind. Um, but if you have, if you ask a question, I can put it back on just as fast as. Or, so questions, comments, concerns. And I guess the, the one place where you you put in a reduction of fifty-five thousand uh, in salary costs, um, as you say, that you know they're still thinking about which is the best way to structure positions, so that that's. That's indicating a dollar amount, but it's not indicating an actual, you know, how positions may be moved around a little bit. Is that, am I understanding correctly? Yeah, that's correct. So the the fifty five thousand is a, a dollar mark that we're looking at to reduce wages at this point, and depending on the needs of the building, um, and what the administration feels as priority based on feedback from you know a variety of different folks, will determine how we proceed with that. Right. So I know the $55,000 could be the team leader position that we've put in. If it did end up, if we even ended discussing that it could be somebody who's an existing employee, would that person be given a courtesy heads up before it was discussed in a public meeting? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think Ben um, might have some resignations. I could be remembering wrong because we're doing all of this in the same week, but the perfect opportunity is if we have, um, you know, an IA or two who are resigning or, you know, not up for renewal, then we're not actually eliminating people's jobs. We're eliminating, not replacing them in their positions. So that would be ideal if we could go that route. I mean, I think so. And that's what, you know, we're kicking around the idea of this, um, special education leader in the building. There's there's some, some, some sig significant needs in our building, um, you know, right now and having oversight of them, um, the more we talk about it, the more it makes sense in the sense of, um, you know, costs of, of, you know, costs and putting together plans for students um, in the best manner. And Ben's running around to having to do, kind of oversee that as well as overseeing the other operations of the building. Um, as we kind of talked about in the past, other, like size elementaries have this type of position. Um, and, you know, we, but given the, you know, if we had the money, we would say move forward hundred percent, kind of giving it a tight kind of spot we're in. We're trying to, we're still thinking about whether or not we should be reducing somewhere else in order to get this position um, and kind of, you know, trying to be on the offensive when we're always defensive in our budget and, and try to make sure that we're, you know, setting things up in the school that, um, isn't reactionary, but is 
you know, thinking ahead about how we should maybe structure it differently based on the needs. So that's why we're kind of paused tonight about how to, we didn't fully commit <laughs> prior to this budget. <laughs> Keith, you had something? I, I got a few questions actually. So um, one, I would echo Darius's comments. I've only been working with my superintendent pretty closely and uh, he would echo the same thing about the, the chapter 70 funding seems to be what the legislature does not really want to touch the they will go after regional transportation they will go after circuit breaker there was something uh i was being explained to me that if we reduce our circuit breaker costs for this year then the reimbursement next year will be less so we have to be very careful about how we play that i think darius if you can uh echo am i right in that regard i'm not 100 percent. i'm gonna have to look at that i don't um I didn't hear that. The, it's so it just it kind of makes sense, and my math brain doesn't work as well. But if we reduce any kind of reimbursements, no, sorry, if we reduce any costs this year, the reimbursements next year would be less. So, like, if we pay off—that's correct. Yes, yes, right. It's, it's like so we have to be very careful about how we're doing that. I mean, um, so I was going to ask if that fifty-five thousand eliminated was the teacher leader position. I would be really reticent to add positions right now. I, I think it would be really good if that was like a collateral move, if we did have IAs resigning and then that we could use that position to go in there. But really, I would, I would have a hard time like defending adding positions now. Um, I do think that 20% uh, cut in chapter 70 is just pulled out of the air. And I think it would be much more responsible just to go with a level funded budget rather than trying to hit the 20% mark. Um, and then the only, th the two questions I had were, the, the the savings of twenty five thousand in school choice that would go back into school choice does that get factored into the where is it fifty one thousand that we had and then that we we would use uh, was it thirty thousand I mean does that all get mixed together? Yes, I'm here. So the twenty five thousand came off in the initial first reduction that we've done done. So that got us to where we are now. So that's already included. So we have 51,000 to go with that 25 already accounted for. Okay. But, uh, that, but that number sorry. is that 25,000 is not included in the current numbers you're seeing for school choice. On the third page there in this, in this report, I didn't add that in and then take it back out. I wanted to do all of that once we made some decisions tonight. Okay. And then just my last question, and this one's like, uh, if we're talking about 40,000 are needed for technology devices and we're talking about using 20,000, how do we determine like who gets what, are, are we gonna be able to go to one-to-one -to -one by only spending half of what we need? So there's two ideas about the one-to-one, -one. okay? So the first one is, um, you know, Ben, you could probably talk about the number of devices out. You want, I saw you unmuted, so what, what, Yeah, yeah, I can jump on that. Um, so right now we've loaned out around 60, 65 devices in total. So that um, tells us that families already have access to remote learning devices that allow for live, live meetings. We also already do have a technology line item and we could potentially use some money from that, which is built into the existing budget year after year purchase devices as well. That line item, line item wouldn't cover everything, um, the full 40,000, but it would definitely cover a portion of it. And I think the other the other part to consider with the one-to-one -one model um, is it's not just the students who are taking it home, um, but when the students, if we are able to come back to some capacity in the fall, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, um, but you know, the sharing of computer devices um, right, as, right before we went to closure, we had these, you know, you know, you had to wipe down the device before you used it. You had to wipe down the device after you used it. You know, um, you think about all those devices in the younger age, ages in the amount of wear. It's not great for screens and stuff to all be wiped down and that kind of thing. So that's another kind of add-on um, to be at the one-to-one -one level. You know, I think it's also, I'll be honest with you, our teachers have adapted so much to the online model that I think you're going to see more technology probably used than we've ever seen before just because they discovered different learning um, things they could do there as well. So I think there's going to be a, a, at the same time a want for more technology. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of kind of queued up nicely that this is might you know, should be the way we go. So I guess my, my question was, would we be able to provide a one to one for everybody? There's not going to be left aside. 
Yeah, it's going to be close. It depends on. Um, so um, that the number that Scott Paul gave us, our director of, te of technology, he said it's going to cost you about forty thousand dollars to go to a one to one model, and that includes repairing the current devices. We're we're estimating probably about a ten percent um, repair rate on what was gone out to homes by the time we get them back. Um, it, it's his based on the number of devices he's already had come in. So that's going to be a, it's a part of that forty thousand, a few thousand on that, um, buying new screens, new keyboards, um, and then I believe one set of devices is age is close to aging out. Is that correct, Ben? Um, and so it includes one classroom set that's going to probably be tossed. Or we're going to take, we're going to use it as long as we can, um, but it's going to be replaced. Um, and then yeah, and then that's a one to one model there after that. So. It's going to be pretty close, um, you know. Right, and with some of the older models of Chromebooks, they stop pushing updates, and at that point, it's it's time to um, get new ones. We are, with the life expect expectancy of these, we're kind of drying it out as long as we can. The good news, Ben, is I had a conversation with Scott this morning, and our life expectancy of a Chromebook was five years. He said that the newer ones coming out are now probably around seven. So yay, they're not making us throw out their devices and buy new ones by having software that fails to update as quickly. So disposable world we're in. Yeah, um, I mean, that. I thought that was a very thorough presentation. My questions got answered, if not in what Shelley presented directly, certainly with some of the follow-up questions. Um, and uh, to sort of echo some of Peter's comments, uh, this isn't as dire a situation as I thought we were getting into. Uh, these recommendations, uh, if we can go back to the select board and we discuss whether we do this and say, look, uh, we heard and understood uh, the request for that uh, a 20% drop in chapter 70. That's not what we're hearing. and. We think that this reflects what's going to happen and at the same time preserves uh, positions that need to be preserved. Um, yeah, that's certainly something that uh, I'm comfortable with as long as, as we have, we can back it up. Yeah, I mean, I also understand that, you know, we went to the, the Frontier Committee as well, went to a level funded budget and, um, is giving Sunderland a savings of just about seventy-four thousand um, dollars reduction. Um, so, you know, when I look at schools, and I, I really started having conversations with with many of you about looking as one unit, because if Frontier did not adjust, and then the town would be stuck with, um, you know, a, a higher percentage, and then it would have to take it out, so to speak, on the elementary school as one of its you know largest um, spots there. So. I think that I think the town's looking for you know they don't know nobody knows where the number is so if it's a shot in the dark, um, you know the worst case scenario is that you know this uh, the state legislature they said they're not going to have a budget even be presented until July one and now they're talking about the time that gets through all the rigmarole it does you're talking about late August maybe September um, you know if there's going to be major adjustments at that point. You know, that's the only, that's the only kind of, uh, that's the risk we're taking in all our budgets, I guess, because at that point, you know, Frontier will get its assessment because if they do check, cut those things, um, those other revenue sources and such. So the town will be in the same boat. So if I can just uh, anticipate one question we might hear, if we take this back to the uh, select board. Um, and this is something we've, I know we've discussed in other uh, domains. Um, some people say, well, uh, you take maybe a pessimistic view and then add back in if things turn out better than you expected. Um, so another option hypothetically could be to say, no, let's, let's project the full 20% and then uh, fold money back in if it's available. I, be be problematic? To, I, I would, I would be willing to play a bet with the, with the, the town of Sunderland. They're not going to like it, but I'll say, you know what, we will pay the exact, amount of chapter 70 reduction and that's it because when they level fund it 
the town's going to get hit on other things. They're going to get hit on their other chapters than chapter 90, you know, and they, all the other kind of things they're hit on. And they're not going to get hit on chapter 70. And they're going to still need the school's money in order to make up the difference on those other lines. So by saying 20% of chapter 70, I think, I don't know where the mentality was. They were better off where they were be, in the first part. I was like, let's just reduce overall budgets by a certain percentage. You know, that kind of thing. Because when you're looking at chapter 70, if they don't cut chapter 70, or if they cut it by level funding it, which is a small percentage cut. Um, I mean, schools would win, so to speak, but the town would not be able to afford the overall cuts without the school, the school's percentage in the budget, without the school doing something, I think, that kind of thing. But um, you're right, if, I doubt, you know, I doubt they're gonna, you know, if we say we'll cut 20% of chapter 70, and then they don't cut anything in chapter 70, they cut it all in chapter 90, or whatever, I'm not even sure if that's the right chapter, but the other town's funding sources they're not going to say, hey, school, take the money back. We, we'll, we'll figure it out their way out to take yeah, yeah. care of the plows and the, and the ambulance and all the other stuff that has to be funded. I would also add that, that it is important to remember, Darius did say that the, the, I, I feel like the frontier budget is being built by trying to help all the elementary schools. That's like a significant factor in mind as we're going through all the different parts is like, how is this going to have the effect to help the elementary schools? So that, that idea of one unit. I guess where I was going with that was um, I was hoping someone would talk to why it's hard to, uh, if more money shows up than you expected, uh, switch programs back on. In other words, uh, preparing for a worst case, obviously we're talking about uh, positions at that point. And it's not necessarily easy to say, well, you know, we think we might eliminate your position. We're going to plan on that. But if money shows up, maybe we'll hire you back. It feels like a, not a very good way to go unless there's really unless there were better indicators that the situation was worse than i think we're we're hearing it's going to be that's also a person that goes out and gets another job or or, or makes decisions based upon that and then we can't easily turn back on exactly let's also remember if we let someone go they can file for unemployment and so we're paying 60 percent of their, their their salary anyways so um, you know, you got to be careful about how we do reductions when we talk about unemployment costs, because unemployment, and just for those who don't follow the employment world, usually people who are, you know, are laid off and such, unemployment is a backup to not getting another job. In this economy right now, it's almost the first step because the other jobs aren't sitting in wait right at this moment in time. So anybody we let go, we pretty much are going to guarantee be paying unemployment, which is 60%. And so you can chime in if I misspoke on that at all, but we talked about that. And that doesn't go on us, it goes in the town, but we're all as one. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's that's what I want to get at too. Is is that you're for every dollar that you reduce for the school, you're you're actually only reducing uh, the town by forty percent. So you have to you have to do like a two point five cut to actually save the town dollars, which uh, you'd have to be. And then and then you're looking at people choosing out and, and an exodus like you had in two thousand and eight. And I'll be honest, if, if things aren't as bad as even as we put it. Um, we need to put a little bit of stuff together for 22. Because 22 is going to be, and we're gonna have to have that conversation with the towns and if any of the select board members are watching, you know, we're gonna have to have a discussion early because Sunderland's gonna need an extra teacher next year. Uh, right, Ben, am I correct in that? If I, if I remember my things right? So we're gonna need an extra teacher next year and they're talking about 22 being awful financially. It's gonna be far worse off than this year. And so whatever we have in, you know, it's gonna be the rainy day year where you're gonna see us, I think, probably having to use almost all our reserves to an uncomfortable level, at least, um, in order to tr keep, you know, I, I don't know what really bad means, but in order to keep um, solid programs going in, in our building. So, um, but I, I just, I, I'm also, all our budgets, in all our budget conversations we're having with all the schools is, we're also bracing for 22. We're building this with enough reserves, bracing for 22. <clears throat> I think I just think this is the right approach because I think that um, it, uh, uh, it 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 doesn't uh, lay out any program cuts. OK, and that's really important when it comes to uh, when it comes to the quality of education or it comes to morale, when it comes to our, uh, you know, our 
ability to project ourselves as a, as a desirable place for school choice people. It's, it's, it's all that, it matters in a bunch of different ways. And uh, on the one hand, we've been asking for a target of how much to cut, and we've, we've, we've sort of been thrown one target and then another target. Um, nobody knows at this point. Um, you know, if nobody knows, and I think at this point to go, you know, there's, if, if they say, well, come on, you got to be honest, we asked for 175,000 cut, you only gave us 145,000. We say if the 175 is really necessary, another 30 comes out of school choice. Okay. And again, we're not cutting music. We're not cutting art. We're not cutting, uh, you know, whatever else is a key part to the education at the elementary school. And even, you know, Tom Fyden Kemet's member of the Board of Selectmen, he said when he was going to school, he said music was one of the most important things to him because, you know, the normal learning and, you know, it didn't click so well with him and so on. But what it really saved him was playing an instrument or two. And it really kept him involved in education and so on. And that's, you know, kids learn all different ways. Um, and the more that we can continue to uh, address all those different ways, the, the better school we are and the more appealing school we are. And it just, you know, I'm so glad we're not sitting here and, you know, deciding, okay, which of these elective programs we're going to have to chop and going through all that because, you know, I'm just delighted with this. And I'm also delighted that um, you've, you're still, despite the cuts, you're making steps to up our technology uh, abilities because, you know, obviously everybody's seeing that's more and more important and, and both right now and in the coming year because we don't know what the fall is going to be like. And so, uh, you know, making sure we, we up our ability to uh, provide for each of our students uh, to the best possible way to do the remote learning, you know, that's also really important. So, you know, I think Darius and Shelley have put together something real good here. It's similar to what I saw. You know, Chris, you know, I'm retired. I got nothing to do. I've been watching school committee meetings. And two nights ago, it was Frontier. And last night, it was Deerfield. And it's very similar what they're presenting to us to what was presented at those two meetings. And what I thought was going to be, you know, the place that we were going to get clobbered was we didn't have the school choice reserves that Frontier has or that Deerfield had. But that's why this, um, you know, additional work that's being done to make sure that we, we, we gather all the possible revenues we can get through the school choice program is, is really important. Um, I'm sort of hoping that, that uh, some of that will carry over at FY22 also, but, you know, we don't know until you get through the year. Um, but anyway, I'm, you know, I, I, this, is, this is certainly better than I was expecting we were going to be looking at. And thank you guys. So, so you, know, know, you want to, what do you need in the way of, of votes so from the, Darius? Shelly's going to, vote? yep, Shelly's going to put the number you need to vote on the chat box. <laughs> uh, that's, that's been the kind of the game plan. Um, and you just need to vote an adjusted number um, to send to, and then we will send it off to the town or Peter will send it by the time we log off. <laughs> um, but we, well, we'll, we will formally send it to the town. Uh, Shelly will formally send it to the town the next day or so. Um, Right, Shelly? That's how we do this? All right. So, did you put it in there? Yeah, 2954946. Yep. So, do you need a motion to... <clears throat> that sounded like a motion. So, can I move that, Greg? Yes, yes, you can. You just did. Motion of... Second? To modify the budget to $2,954,946. All right. And who seconded? I have a procedural question before we actually vote. Let's hear it. I'll, well, I'll second, and then we go to discussion, right? Yeah, yeah. We still have discussion after after the move is second. Okay. All right. Discussion. What do you got, so Jessica? Procedurally, if we if we vote this in now, this will replace the budget that we already voted on, and we don't need a second public hearing for this replacement budget. That's correct. After you have a public hearing, you can you can submit another budget. Um, and especially because it's lower, um, that usually is not the problem either. <laughs> okay. But yes, um, that's correct. You just need a time to talk about the budget um, in a public in a public hearing. You have to have a public hearing on a budget so everybody can put their input to it. Um, so we're okay there. And so my question would be, uh, I'm looking at 
two million nine fifty four nine forty six. If we ha as a level funded, but if we had met school committee's ask of a twenty percent reduction in chapter seventy, that number would be two million nine twenty four. Approximately. There's only so by coming in that with this, we're coming in very close to what they had asked in the first place. Correct. We're $144,000, $145,000 less instead of $175,000 less. Okay. Yeah, because basically the increase was 4.9. They asked for five, so we're just about there. Okay. All right. Any additional discussion? All right. Uh, I Maybe this we one do. we want to do a, yep. a roll call. Uh, yes. Keith? Yes. Uh, Jessica, Ma Maisie. Yes, sorry, I'm struggling. Okay, uh, and I say yes, and Peter. Yes. All right. That so five, five nothing. Maisie, Maisie didn't say. Oh my <laughs> Are we five nothing? Five nothing. Yes. Thank you. Just let people know on these on these things. Control D shuts you on and off mic if you're ever having trouble with the mouse thing. If people are. Or like the fast keys. <clears throat> Do you need a vote on the technology uh, thing? Um, no, I don't think we do. Shelly, we don't need a vote on that, right? Shelly froze. Yep. Shelly left. The, the budget's approved. Uh, I, I know you guys make a lot of choices with respect to how to spend it. Uh, in that case, it's policies next. I just, uh, I just wanted to check to make sure they didn't need a vote on the technology thing, because I was at Deerfield last night. They were ending up, I think, voting on something with regard to technology, and I didn't know if we had the same need or not. They voted, you know what you could do, because they voted last night to spend the money on technology and roll the remaining into school <laughs> choice. Um, and not roll it into school choice, but re, you know, um, reallocate expenses, reallocate it to, to school choice. Um, I think that would be prudent in the sense that any remaining money by regular standard would be go back to the town. And so that you're proving that because we reduced our budget and paid a lot and paid a portion out of school choice, we want to take the frozen funds and put them into school choice as part of that. And so I think voting that is just making it um, very clear that you. I don't know. I think it's put you're, you're very, I don't think it matters in the sense of someone come back and say that you didn't or didn't vote it right, but you are making a statement that you understand where all the money is going and that you are, you know, taking those funds and, and transferring them over. So, and I do think technically school committee is supposed to approve transfers. So if we just had a general agreement that whatever that savings is at the end of the year, we'll transfer that in a school choice, that would be great. So, Shelly, do you want to vote or not? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> it's a motion to approve a transfer of funds from Trace Technology. What's the so you don't need it for the technology. You need it for the rolling, the transferring of all remaining funds for this year into school choice. And we don't know what that number is. We know it's going to be around twenty thousand, but those are variable because we haven't paid all those bills yet. I'm speaking for Shelly. I'm getting good at it. <laughs> okay, so it's basically a motion to move any excess funds at the end of the year into school choice. Perfect. Second. All in favor? Got aye. Aye. Jessica, aye. aye, aye. Peter, five to zero. Um, remind me who seconded that. I did. Okay, hang on one sec while I write this down. Okay. Thank you. Good, good catch. All right. So now policies. So basically, these are the policies we sent before, minus the um, the uh, public comment policies during school committee meeting. We had a dispute there. I sent, I did send that off to Adam to look it over. 
And uh, I'm just being honest, I haven't followed up to track that down. I've been doing a few other things, you wouldn't believe it. Um, so um, I think these, this group is ready to go and then we'll, when we'll get back to that, that other one. And I think there's a few others that MASC has sent out as well that we'll put a package together in a future date. So um, again, this is the, you can vote them together as a group or you're allowed to in the sense that other uh, committees have done it as well. Um, basic instructional program, it's it, it's uh, it's redundant. The school ins uh, student insurance program, there's now a law regarding insuring students. Um, so that can be removed. The guidance program is redundant and the student gifts, there's now a um, ethics law um, that takes the place of those policies. So really straightforward stuff. So we're basically moving to remove all four of them, correct? That's correct. Do you want a motion, Greg? Yes, please. So I'll make I a motion, motion to remove policies uh, IHA, JLA, JLD, and JP because they're no longer... I mean, Ben's going to be upset he's not going to get the gifts as much from the students, but um, I think it's probably in the best interest. All right. Tyler, I'll second. A second? I'll second. Excellent. So Jessica seconds. Thank you. And uh, all in yeah, favor? Yeah. Or discussion? Any discussion? No. All, right, all in favor? Aye. All right. Five, Five to zero. Thank you. All right. And that takes us to new business update on curriculum, including uh, during COVID-19. So, Ben, I know you have this as part of your principal's report, but um, I think it's best if you could jump on and kind of give us an overview. Um, before he does, I just wanted to, to I, I mentioned this the other night at Deerfield as well. Um, you know, we went through three, three phases and um, to get where we are now, and Ben will talk about the third phase. We kind of updated you on the other phases, but I just have to recognize, um, as I did last night, that we couldn't have gone through these three phases as smoothly as we had without the teachers really just taking it on right out of the gate. You know, we, we were providing instruction on Monday morning. What was that? The 13th is when we left. So the 17th, um, because our teachers were, you know, were ready to jump right in and get going. Um, a lot of other districts, I mean, they spent, there's some other districts that waited a full month before they started going into the houses um, virtually into the houses and, and being with the kids and our teachers, you know, went right at it right from the beginning, and it's made all the difference. It's at the stage where we can be at today. Um, they've um, they've kind of got went with it, you know, and it's difficult to kind of just go with it sometimes. And they they go with it, and they know that they had to change and adapt as they learned and figured things out. Um, but I just want to you know tip my hat to them and um, tip my hat to Kim McCarthy, who kind of was the uh, the orca the, uh, the person who wrote up the kind of the plans and helped coordinate that, and then of course my principal team. Um, obviously, including Ben, um, who you know helped deliver that. So, just thanks, thanks to all of them. Right. I said that to you. Didn't have to, Ben. <laughs> so, Ben, why don't you give us an overview of what's going on there? Sure, and I and I can kind of hop to my principal's report now as well. Um, but as Darius mentioned, we are now in the third and final phase of remote learning to close out the school year. Uh, due to the length of the closure, DESE has updated their remote learning expectations um, a few different times, and that's has allowed us to make subtle changes to our plan from the beginning. Um, you know, and Darius already mentioned it, but really the flexibility and the responsive approach our teachers have demonstrated during this time of school closure has very, has been quite admirable. Um, they have taken a really, really horrible situation and have made, made the most out of it. Um, teachers are meeting with families. Um, they're driving to houses to deliver work packets. They're calling them uh, all hours of the day. We had teachers offer group lessons and Google meet opportunities over April vacation. So that's really been, Nothing short of of remarkable with um, what our you know our teaching staff has been delivering continues to do. So with that being said, the updated learning plan features um, uh, three spit was updated in three specific areas. One was um, increased learning rigor for prerequisite standards. So the state released prerequisite standards um, for the remote learning time. Um, and that identify that has allowed us to identify priority assignments for the students. 
We've also focused on deepening our teacher to student and student to teacher learning feedback opportunities. So that's we're making sure that students are using proper strategies to complete assignments. And we're also providing um, and have been uh, providing feedback during live meets and uh, and through submitting of assignments, pictures or uh, or short notes. You know, this this subtle change, a lot of this has really been happening from the beginning. And, and I feel like in a way our, our teaching staff was well, well ahead of the curve with this. And lastly, um, increasing accountability. And so now we're really looking at taking attendance for student engagement in both screen and uh, non-screen learning activities for completion of work. We're also ensuring that um, students are accessing the new learning and are providing feedback and we're providing feedback to continue growth. Each family is dealing with this situation differently. And we know that every family is able to access the remote learning platform um, in different ways. So really the, the foundation that allows for a strong remote learning program is the relationships that we have with our students and our families. And, I, and once again, um, the Sunderland staff has really made a concerted effort to, to reach out to families and, and meet them where they're at. So that's kind of a, the remote learning plan in a, in a nutshell. Do you have any questions? All right. No, I, just, I just want to say, I think that what you guys are doing is just awesome. Um, it seems like from day one, there's been a, a spirit of can do rather than can't do, or, you know, like, how do we, it's not like, oh, God, we're just overwhelmed by the problem. It's like, okay, keep knocking whatever impediments are, keep knocking them down, keep moving forward. And I, it's just it's just been such a pleasure to to sort of observe um, just the fantastic attitude that everybody has had about how to make what is a really lousy situation as good as possible. And I just want to, Ben, you and, and your whole staff has just been fantastic. The, um, the, the work of our staff has been absolutely in, incredible and I'm very fortunate and, and lucky, lucky to be working with all of them. And, and I would echo Peter's comments. Uh, our, our, my unique family situation is that my wife sits in one room doing elementary school teaching and I sit in another room teaching high school and doing online work with high school teens is far, far easier than trying to do online work with elementary school kids. The amount of work that the elementary school teachers are putting in is really tremendous. And the, the offerings that they're, they're giving the kids and the help that they're giving families and the schedule that they're putting out and the understanding they're having that I'm seeing is, is really tremendous. And it, it far exceeds what has to do with my students. I'm also teaching remotely, and I'd love to just take a second to publicly appreciate uh, Sarah Underwood, who has made online teaching look really easy and it's really not. She's meeting with these kindergartners and they never stop squirming on their screens, but she's still getting them to, to practice their writing with her. And she's offered weekly one-on-one -on -one check ins with all the kids through, through video learning and everything that she sent us has been really accessible. And we're just having an experience that I wouldn't have expected would be possible for remote kindergarten learning. Yeah, it's amazing, yes. <laughs> Outstanding. So Greg, the follow-up to the other portion of the update on curriculum and COVID is the what's gonna happen with summer and what's gonna happen with next year. So kind of just give you a word. But we're seeing it right now. Um, you know, right now, summer, we're still kind of holding off. I, I basically said I was gonna wait till June 1st. You look at the information we have on June 1st to make a make a decision. It looks like that you know um, right now we're starting to starting to edge forward with virtual learning this summer for those students who um, require services over the summer. Um, it, it may be hopes of maybe doing some face-to-face -face stuff in August, but you know um, right now we're we're starting to line up the virtual stuff. We haven't made the final decision, but um, it, it's not looking great at this point in time, um, as well as the enrichment activities and that kind of thing. So um, that's coming next year is. Um, you know, we started to plan to plan is basically how I, I've seen it, um, you know, in the sense that we're kind of laying out the different things that we're going to have to 
consider and think about. But I also think it's very early to start saying to what is it going to look like, um, all the different kind of models that are being put out there with kids six feet apart, and we're going to do barriers, and we're going to do we're going to walk down the hallway one way, and we're going to wear things in our heads that keep us six feet apart. Did you guys see that picture? Um, you know, it's, there's just a lot of crazy ideas out there, and at the same time, we're getting information of the, the counters. You know what I mean? Where um, yeah. and so. I'm just telling families right now, right, you know, for um, and it kind of goes into the next thing where we talk about calendars for next year. If we're going to be back in the building, where it's going to be the last week in August, so don't schedule that that to be a week away in August. Pick a different week, um, but that's when we plan on coming back to school um, and what that'll look like. It's going to be, I imagine, we're still going to be doing some planning right up to the end of July into early August to, to know exactly what it looks like. So, yeah. Uh, answer any questions on that? I'm sitting on a hundred of phone calls of those things, just talking about it. And a lot of it is circular, you know. Um, I, I mean, I, I agree with everything that was said before in terms of uh, the school has done a fantastic job of figuring out what it can do and just going ahead and doing it. Um, but as you get into the fall, you're right. There's going to be questions about uh, free and appropriate education and special education, and how how does that uh work into a distance learning model versus uh what can you do in a, in a classroom so i know you're going to be seeing a lot of changes over the summer and trying to roll that in yeah my biggest fear just to be chatting about that is the to not what have not to go forward what happened in march march the week of march 9th where basically you had um superintendents having to make decisions in in, in spite of boards of health and in spite of the of the commissioner and the governor and um, that whole kind of, that's my fear, is that um, there's not gonna be a coordinated, I'm hoping that the leadership of the state steps up and gives clear guidance. Um, they did put a, a committee together, a group of the minds of the state to look at reentry and what that's going to look like. Um, that committee met last week. Um, we'll see what they came out with. However, all my other information coming from the state's always been, a, been late. We've got ahead on everything based on good decisioning. Shelly and I attended a, a budgeting seminar today. We were like, gosh, this would have been helpful about a month and a half ago. You know what I mean? Like, but we felt like I, the joke was it felt like the teacher was we were we were correcting our assignments at our desk as they were going through a list of everything we should consider. We were like, yep, we did that. Oh, yep, we did. Oh, phew, I got that one right, you know, as we went down. So um they're gonna have to they're gonna have to come up with something or else you're gonna have that disagreement and we can't have that um you know, where some people are doubting what schools should be and shouldn't be doing. So that's my only fear, but that's the COVID update. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Then in that case, uh, joint meeting discussions. So just, it was more of an FYI, I probably could have done it in the superintendent report, um, but um, we do need to have a joint meeting in June. My mentality was, was let's get the school committee through budget season, and then we'll have the joint meeting, um, not knowing what budget season was gonna look like. You know, I didn't know if we were gonna have to have multiple meetings and back and forth, and maybe we, we still will, but hopefully not. Because um, we do have to take care of the two things, the superintendent evaluation and the school calendar um, for next year has to be voted, and we kind of have to do it together, or else, as you know, you, yeah. you can't have one kind of voted on that. Um, the school calendar is kind of held up, we had a draft ready to go for April, and it's you know sitting on my desk in the sense of we, we're trying to look at what kind of professional development needs we have to have for our faculty going back. If we go back, um, if we go back into a regular setting or a modified setting, you know, do we switch the, our professional development schedule to front load a little bit more than the Friday you know proposal that and we had a different, a slightly different Friday proposal, but it looked it looked very similar to what we were already doing. Um, but do we have to front load more, uh, especially when we start talking about do we have to have more teacher communication to discuss, you know, where students are at, how we're going to modify curriculums, you know, that kind of stuff as, you know, um, getting the kids up to speed, um, you know, because while they're learning at home, they're not, it isn't the same as learning in school. So there's going to be gaps in certain areas and, um, you know, we're going to have to help the teachers um, figure out how to address that. So anyway, that's what we're discussing now within the school calendar. Um, but again, as I said to people, when they want to know when school's going to start, you know, basically that that Wednesday, that last Wednesday in August has been our key date for as long as I can remember. So people are looking at 
renting a secluded beach house. <laughs> That's what they need to think about. Outstanding. All right, and like you say, we'll, we'll vote the calendar then. Um, any reports? Collaborative meet or? It wasn't on the list of, uh, but normally it is for capital projects. Okay. Uh, the town uh, had a, the capital planning committee had a meeting uh, Tuesday last week and essentially they're, they're, they're putting a limit on capital projects for this cycle for obvious reasons. But since the town raises through a uh, capital, uh, special capital uh, tax each year, roughly 115,000 is now the amount, it seems that it's, it's okay to go ahead with that amount of spending on capital, but not to add anything more from free cash or stabilization like it's been done in other years. So that um, with that being the, the upper limit, uh, we had the first run through on the requested projects. Uh, the school had uh, two priority projects in there. One was multi-year dealing with the siding problem outside. The other was a multi-year dealing with flooring replacement. Um, the, the first one was uh, just under 10,000 a year. The second one was 18,000 a year. Uh, on the first run through, uh, both of those were approved, but there's a bunch to go, but at least we're, um, you know, we're still in the game. I just want to give Ben a shout out because uh, for whatever reason, you know, mainly getting to get dealing with this whole virtual stuff, uh, those items weren't even on the list when the meeting started. And I got like a list an hour beforehand and said a help send off a quick help message to Ben, like, you know, what can we get? And by the time the meeting had started, Ben had provided all the information for us. And so, you know, we got, I thought we were just going to basically get nothing. And so he saved the day on that one. And um, there's still, we got the next meeting uh, this coming Tuesday and uh, you know, we'll see, but at least so far so good. Outstanding. Thank you for that, Peter. And, th and thank you, Ben. All right. And speaking of Ben, uh, principal's report. I, I think we sort of did that, didn't we? Yeah. I, I had a little bit more to add as, as well. Um, just last week, uh, in an effort to keep families um, up to date, on what's been happening. We held our second family informational session since the closure of school. Um, the purpose of these events are to provide families with uh, regular updates of our remote learning plans and also allow time for question and answers. Um, in addition to district administrators who are present, um, SES faculty members Jeannie Johnson and Vicki Palmer also provided app updates. So very appreciative that they took the time out of their evenings to um, join and present to families. Next week is Spirit Week at Sunderland Elementary School. And so we have a uh, bunch of fun things planned for the students on one of the days features bringing uh, your stuffed animal or pet to all Google Meet sessions. We have a crazy hat day. We have a sunglasses day. We have a wellness day. And then uh, we're ending the week with an all school um, sing, all school uh, assembly, virtual assembly, of course, where we'll, we'll sing songs and uh, do some presentations and book, book reads for the kids. So we're really excited about that. Um, also, we have uh, a sixth grade arts showcase that we're putting together to honor our departing sixth grade students. Next week, we have scheduled a, um, a sixth grade parent informational session where we'll talk to them about graduation plans and uh, different ways that we're planning on honoring their, their kids. We also have uh, in the works a walk and roll day and a Sunderland in action day. And I, at the select board meeting on Monday night, I talked about that a little bit as well. And so we're looking at some different projects that can still take place around, uh, around the town. And that's the report. Nice, outstanding. 
Time to live in action in a COVID world. That's right. All right. Um, any other any questions about that or moving on to, to Darius, superintendent's report? We're good. All right. Darius, you're more than welcome to attend Spirit Week. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that perhaps you could record your singing portion and present it at the next school committee meeting. Yeah, I, I think I might have to end up doing a solo, and I'm not not too excited about it, but we'll see we'll see how it goes. All right. So now I understand we're uh, we're going to go to an executive session and then probably not come back into this room. Is this similar to what like an FCAT thing? Well, so if you you know the executive session is you know is optional if you want to go into it. Uh, yep, yeah, you can we can discuss um, because we're still in uh, collective bargaining, so it's on the agenda in case anybody ever wants that. That's why I keep putting it there. Um, but basically, we we leave one session to go to another one in order to be secure because this is streamed and such. Indeed. Do we need to do that? I wouldn't think so at this time. But all right, what's your decision? In that case, uh, um, do we want to do that? All right. Does it does there, there's not much. Uh, I guess so. Uh, let's see. Um, in that case, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn if no one has anything else. Wait, so there's no negotiations update? I thought there was a negotiation session on the calendar on Monday. No? So we'll let's go to the executive update, session. Huh? Yeah. Let's do that. So we'll, uh, we're just going to say that we're going to adjourn out of that meeting. And we don't have Correct. to you're going to go you're going to go into executive session and not return to um open session afterwards all right so uh i guess i'll see you all in executive session thanks everyone you gotta vote you gotta vote in oh i think we gotta vote we are uh, i haven't gotten to executive a roll session call. Yet, so there, there we go we're gonna take a roll call vote on the record isn't there a uh, separate link for the executive session yep, there there actually, okay yeah yeah all right so i'll entertain a motion Move to adjourn public session. Oh, yeah. Executive session. I'll, 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 uh, uh, pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. Uh, yeah, move to go to executive session. Second. Somebody? I'll second. Excellent. All right. All in favor? I guess we got a roll call. Keith? Yes. Peter? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Greg? Yes. Okay. Five to zero.